All right. <laughs> Greetings, everyone, and welcome back to our second installment of Ask Beverly. My name is Kimberly Springle, and I'm the director at the Charles Sumner School Museum and Archives. And we are so delighted to have Beverly Palmer back, our Charles Sumner Scholar. How are you doing, Beverly? Welcome. I'm doing okay. Yes. <laughs> awesome. Awesome. We had a great introductory segment a few weeks ago, and we're back this month in February to celebrate Black History Month. So we're going to continue to delve into the life of Senator Charles Sumner, our building's namesake. Um, again, he was a pioneering civil rights activist. And so we really want to broaden our knowledge about him. So to our audience out here, we want these segments to be interactive. So if you have any questions for Beverly, it is called Ask Beverly, our Charles Sumner expert. So please send us emails if you want to know any facts or any, if you have any questions about Senator Charles Sumner, his life, his legacy, you can email us at info.sumnermuseum at dc.gov. Again, that is info.sumnermuseum at dc.gov. So it is February, it is Black History Month, and it is also uh, the month of the birth of none other than Frederick Douglass. So today, we're going to get into the relationship between Senator Charles Sumner and Frederick Douglass. So Beverly's back and I have a few questions for you. Is that okay? Sure, sure. Awesome. So let's, let's kick this off. How did Charles Sumner and Frederick Douglass come to know each other? First, I'm gonna give you just a little background. About a couple of years ago, Kimberly and I started talking about a project and I wanted to look into the letters that Frederick Douglass had written Charles okay. Sumner. And fortunately, they're all available on microfilm. And so I think it was two years ago, I decided to uh, get all those off the microfilm and transcribe them and annotate them briefly. So I compiled a little uh, segment of the letters of Frederick Douglass to Charles Sumner. Unfortunately, Perfect. it's a one-way correspondence because we have only one letter from Charles Sumner to Frederick Douglass. And so it's, uh, you got a lot about Frederick Douglass, but this does shed light on his relationship. And I hope to um, make that clear in, in the interview today. And I'll get back to your question now. And that is, we're not clear when they first met. The fact that Douglass was in New England in his early career and was very obviously active in anti-slavery. Sumner, born in Boston, was known from uh, quite early in his life to be strongly anti-slavery. So they might have met at meetings, but we, we don't have any evidence of that. And the first um, connection is a letter that uh, Sumner gave wrote to Frederick Douglass and Douglass published it in his paper. And that's why we have the letter, the one letter. And that was in 18, um, just a second, I'm gonna look it up, 1853. And uh, it's the only letter from Sumner, as I said. And it was Sumner regretting that he couldn't ac accept an invitation from Frederick Douglass, probably to meet, uh, this, this was in Ro Rhode Island. So that was the beginning of the connection, and uh, I will uh, pursue the uh, relationship as we continue with the interview. Excellent. So um, 1853, that letter um, notes, that's really, I guess, in the thick of the abolitionist movement that is prior to the abolition of slavery. So we do know that both of those figures uh, agreed on that. Um, so my next question is, what issues did they both share allyship on and also what issues were they divided as I assume they didn't agree on everything either. Well for a long time in this correspondence they agreed very strongly. Uh, Sumner would send, excuse me, uh, Douglas would send Sumner numerous letters after Sumner gave a speech. For example, Sumner gave a speech in the Senate of uh, protesting the admission of Kansas as a slave state in 1854. And there's a letter from Douglas to Sumner saying, thank you so much for your speech. And, you know, telling him, please keep up the good fight. Uh, there's another one, there's quite a few, but one, another one is after the uh, <coughs> Congress passed the um, abolition of slavery in the District of Columbia in 1862. And that again was thrilling for Douglas as he expressed to uh, Sumner. 
And uh, then uh, there's another letter where he wrote Sumner, Friends of Freedom, look to you. And he often signed these a grateful friend. Now, we don't know how friendly they were at this stage of their uh, relationship, but uh, clearly Douglas saw Sumner as a friend. And then in 1869, Sumner obviously corresponded with Douglas because he wanted a copy of a uh, speech that Douglas had, had written. And all we have is Douglas responding to Sumner and saying, I'm sending you this copy. But obviously, uh, Sumner was uh, paying attention to what Douglas was saying. Sometimes uh, Sumner objected to articles in Frederick Douglass's newspaper, and he would um, send him, obviously, some kind of criticism, and then Douglas would be writing back to apologize, not really apologize, and trying to explain why he had taken the stand he had. Uh, then in um, January 1871, uh, there was another letter where Sumner, and this makes you realize that Sumner was paying attention to the coverage in Douglas's newspapers mm -hmm. because, uh, and I think this is typical of Sumner, he was very concerned about his image and so he read all the newspapers and if he saw something he didn't like, he would write the editor and say, why did you, why did you say that? So this is a letter we don't have, but it's clear that that's what was going on. Uh, we don't know exactly when the two physically met, they could have been in New England. It could have been in D.C. Um, I think that uh, it's clear that by the time Douglas had moved to Washington, D.C. in uh, 1870, that uh, the two were circulating in a lot of the same circles. And this is, again, it's an inference. But uh, here's a letter that uh, Douglas wrote Sumner uh, regretting missing Sen uh, Senator Sumner, because Sumner had called to the office of Douglas's paper, and by that time it was the New National Era was the paper he was he owned and he he published. Uh, then there's another one when uh, Douglas wrote about his plans to visit Sumner at his home, and that Sumner's home was right across from Lafayette Square at Vermont and H Streets. Unfortunately, it's not standing anymore, but it was right there in the thick of things. And um, Sumner <clears throat> had obviously invited Douglas to come to his house. Then get, going back to the relationship uh, between the two, uh, this was always very cordial. It stayed cordial to the end, as some of these other letters indicate. But um, it turned out that uh, when Grant was president, Sumner was for Grant in his first term, but became very anti-Grant uh, when Grant wanted to annex, annex, excuse me, Santo Domingo. And uh, Sumner was against that. He was against imperialism. He was against uh, spreading uh, the American, uh, spreading American uh, possessions. And uh, so it was very, very anti this, particular project. Sumner gave a speech in the Senate and actually actually, it must have been a very convincing speech because the Senate uh, voted the treaty that Grant had submitted to the Senate, it voted that down. But uh, at this point, uh, this is where Sumner really turned on Grant and mm -hmm. Douglas stayed close to Grant to the end and Sumner did, obviously did not. And uh, so this is where the exchange becomes uh, very, I wouldn't say bitter, but just mm -hmm. testing because so, uh, Douglas would um, publish articles in the paper, Sumner would object to them. And uh, this went on until the uh, election of 1872. And this is mm -hmm. when Sumner gave several speeches strongly against Grant, saying he was not going to vote for Grant and that the black citizens, and of course they were then citizens, should not as well. And Douglas did not agree. Uh, he strongly supported Grant. He liked 
the fact that Grant had enforced Reconstruction legislation, and uh, he was a Republican. Despite these differences, the two continued to meet. And this is, a, again, a letter where Douglas said, I will call on you at five and a half o'clock on Saturday afternoon. <laughs> so the two remained friendly, but, but, <laughs> friendly, but I guess I'd say. Yeah, well, it sounds like it did not fracture, it didn't fracture their relationship in a major way. No, Yeah. and then this is the, the last letter that we have. And Douglas wrote Sumner of his disappointment about not seeing Sumner as he had expected to on Friday. He said, I want much to see you before leaving. Now then right after that, this is 1872, uh, Sumner went off to Europe because his health was poor and that's where he often went. Uh, he sailed from Boston on September 3rd. On September 2nd, as you well know, Kimberly, mm -hmm. everybody at the summer school knows on September 2nd, 1872, was the dedication of the Charles Sumner School. And Douglas attended that. And we have an article from his newspaper where he described being there, how impressed he was. And here's what he said. I'll just read briefly. He called the building one that was intended to bring out in strong light the terrible outrage and wrong that has heretofore been perpetrated upon a people capable of as much improvement as any in the land. That's a great, and that's, that's <laughs> the end. That's all. That's, that's a that great quote. Excellent. Well, looks like you have shared many highlights from the letters that the two exchanged, even though we only have that one side with the exception of that first letter that you quoted. But I want to get like a broader picture from you um, based on your knowledge of Senator Sumner and his actions in Congress and his work and your knowledge of, of Frederick Douglass as well. In what ways do you believe that the two of them influenced each other and their actions toward fighting for civil and human rights and also the advancement of the rights for African Americans? Well, uh, clearly we know of Sumner's influence on Douglas because we have all those letters. And yes. We saw how even though they differed on Grant in 1872, he still looked to Sumner for all the work that he had done for um, his, uh, his race. I project I would like to undertake, uh, and maybe I will, is to uh, look at the other end and see how Douglas might have influenced Sumner. Uh, Sumner certainly uh, treasured the relationships that he had with uh, many Blacks, and particularly in Washington, D.C., and there are letters in the uh, in this microfilm edition of all the people who wrote to him, and many, many uh, African Americans besides Douglas did because of his, his role. Uh, so I would like to go through some of the speeches. I did look in our selected letters that we have of Charles Sumner to see if there was any reference to Douglas in those letters. And unfortunately there isn't. So you can't you can't say it doesn't exist. Right. The letters that we didn't select for the edition might have, you know, saying Douglas wrote me or, you know, I met Douglas for tea or something like that. But but we don't have that. Uh, I, I would like to I don't think I'd ever go through all the 85 reels looking for references of Douglas, but it would be interesting to go through the speeches and see if Sumner picked up quotations from Douglas or how he uh, how he was influenced by him. And that again, Kimberly, is just that one way street that that we have. We know the influence right. one way. As I was thinking about the two um, in preparation for this interview. I started thinking about the similarities between the two men. And you might say, well, you know, one's black, one's white, what's similar? But first of all, and I think this is what everybody would, um, would understand is they were both powerful orators and they were orators in the old fashioned way, long speeches, uh, many fancy multi-syllabic words, they liked that. I was going to read a couple of excerpts from the letters, and I think I still will, just to kind of convey uh, what Sumner was um, 
was receiving from, from Douglas, but uh, they were both very dignified men. For, Douglas was an elegant person. And you look at the pictures of him, he's always in a white shirt, always well turned out. He, and they were both very proud men. And even though Sumner had the education that Douglas got on his own, there was just, I think, some, um, some similarities that probably there was an affinity between those two men. They were dignified, they were proud, they were proud of what they did. And uh, it just is kind of an interesting similarity that I hadn't really thought about till I was getting ready for this interview. Excellent. If there's some fledgling or, or burgeoning researchers out here who are inspired by this talk and want to explore more about right. the relationship yeah. between right. the two men, do you have yeah. recommendations of where else to look? Uh, well, you know, uh, we could go through the, the Sumner's collected works, mm -hmm. and I did have a copy of those. There's something like 20 volumes. Sumner loved his speeches. He poured over them, revising them. Uh, treasuring them. He spent the last years of his life just and on many, many letters to his publisher about how these are going to come about and how he was, and some of them he revised a little. I, there was one where he, uh, somebody wrote him and criticized something he said and he actually changed his speech a little wow, bit. Wow, interesting. <laughs> this interesting. was in his early career and I think he was looking back on this and said, oh, why did I say that? So the collected works has a different, <laughs> different version. It's kind of interesting. But um, so, you know, we, we could go through those volume by volume, looking in the indexes and seeing if there's references to Douglas would be one way, the, the obvious way to do it. I don't know, maybe these volumes are online and then you could just do a, a word search. Be interesting to see. Excellent. This is, yeah. it's, it's exciting to think about, um, you know, delving more into history as we always really so much more research to do but we generally tend to deal with these figures individually, but it would be right. interesting, especially those two who experience such a close relationship. You go to Cedar Hill, to um, Frederick Douglass's home, and there's a, there's a picture of Charles Sumner there in the, in the docent. Exactly, exactly. Always, every tour I've been on, I've been on several tours to Cedar Hill, and they always illuminate and share right. that the two of them shared a close Exactly, exactly. So clearly. Yeah. Um, they had to have influenced each other. I'd love to, to see like evidenced. Um, and did, did Sumner have a picture of Frederick Douglass? Right. I was <laughs> looking at something on Black History Month just, just now. And they said, uh, the, one of the quizzes was, well, what was Frederick Douglass known for? And they named a couple things like agricultural specialist or some, something you knew wasn't. And then right. it said the most <laughs> photographed man. Yes. In America. Now, I don't yes. know whether that's true. I believe that, well, it's, I believe it's true because I've heard it oh, many times. Yeah, I and I'm yeah. just thinking, well, in that mansion that Sumner had, you know, Vermont and H Street, <laughs> did he have a picture of Frederick Douglass? I'm, I'd be we curious have no to know. no way of knowing. We'll, we'll, we'll never know. No, no. Well, this is great. Well, as we wrap up, um, I have one final question for you. Well, I wanted to read, I was going to read a couple of passages, if you don't mind. Oh, sure, sure. And, and this is from... I think one of them, a couple of them are just extremely revealing. When I was tracing the relationship, I was just kind of mentioning this, but I had uh, signaled out a couple of letters that I just think are so interesting and revealing about Douglas. Okay, perfect. And this yes, is please an share. Early letter in 1855. So it's kind of interesting how forthright Douglas was in this letter. Mm -hmm. He says, I may be a little sensitive on the subject of our social position. He says, I mean to say that the simple fact of color should not be the criterion by which to ascertain or to fix the social station of any. Let every man without record to color, with, excuse me, without regard to color, go wherever his character and abilities naturally carry him. And then he went on, I think this is an, an expression that he said quite a, quite a few times. He says, for my own individual part as a colored man, I have little of which to complain. I have found myself socially higher than I am placed politically the most debased white man in New York 
is my superior at the ballot box. This, mm -hmm. of course, is 1855, mm -hmm. but not so in a social point of view. Interesting. Isn't that something? That's very interesting. Yeah. And there was another one. Uh, I think I alluded to the fact that he referred to himself and to Sumner as his friend. But here's one where he just talks about what Sumner meant to him and his race. And this is in 1869. And uh, this is after one of Sumner's two or three hour speeches. And um, again, it's indicative of the kind of regard that um, Douglas had for Sumner. He says, let me join in the shout of the nation. Voices that once, once reached you hoarse with wrath and discouragement are now clear and melodious with praise. During 20 years, you have been to us the leading statesman of the Republic. Today, the nation recognizes the fact. You did not need it for yourself, for yourself, excuse me. Your friends needed the recognition for you. Mm. Especially have you so linked yourself to the liberty and welfare of those with whom I am coupled in the public mind that we share in the glory of all your triumphs. Ah, that's great. Those are great. So aren't we so very fortunate to have these letters um, that we can reflect on as, as, again, as evidence of these relationships? Did you have another excerpt? Well, I have one more and it okay. just kind of, this is when they were, when they were, uh, and at, at odds with each other. Okay, okay. And uh, so this is one after uh, Sumner given one of his speeches and he once he got started against Grant, he just wouldn't stop. I mean, Grant was the most evil person. I mean, he just went on and on way in excess, but that was the way Sumner was. He'd been slighted. I probably should add that Sumner was chair of the Foreign Relations Committee mm. throughout the Civil War and until 1871. And he loved that role. He had actually kind of liked to have been Secretary of State because he'd spent a lot of time abroad and he had many friends in Europe and really um, cherished those relationships. So being chair of the Senate Re Foreign Relations Committee was very important to him and he helped negotiate some treaties and really liked this. After he broke with Grant, Grant and the Republicans were so fed up with Sumner that they got him kicked off his chairmanship. Oh, wow. And he lost that. He lost that power that he had in the Senate. And this was in 1871, and he was extremely bitter about this. Yes, and so yes. it just deepened. His relentless to yeah, I'm sure he was relentless. And Sumner was not one to... Uh, let go of a grudge, as we know. <laughs> right. So this is after Sumner had given one of his blasting grant speeches in the Senate. And some of these, actually, Douglas was there because he said, I have heard you. So when he was living in Washington, <laughs> right. I'm kind of interested in, uh, this is what I started thinking about, was his admission. Did he have trouble because he was a Black man getting uh -huh. into the galleries? Could he have to sit in a special place. I don't know. Someone, again, That's there's a topic for researchers. Could he just walk in and as we all can do now, if you can get in. Now, now you mentioned, you mentioned. I could say before the pandemic. Right. Um, before, you, before you mentioned, before you do that excerpt about the divide that I just want to go back. You mentioned uh, David Blight's book on Frederick Douglass. Yes. Another, uh, several books written about him actually. Was that not mentioned? in Blight's book about how he maneuvered society being a black man, you know, in the capital and, you know, in these spaces. Yeah, he talked about his, uh, yeah, he talked about his, his eloquence. He just, uh, Blight dwelt on, on Douglas's eloquence. And there's one, uh, I was re reviewing my notes on the book and I don't have it, but I wish I did. But uh, there's one where he compares uh, Frederick Douglass's uh, it's not the famous 4th of July speech, but another one to Lincoln's uh -huh. Gettysburg Address. And he kind of goes uh -huh. through it and does this side-by-side -side comparison. A very interesting thing. And it's, I do recommend the book. It's just a wonderful book and very detailed. And you have to 
you know, take take some time out to go through it, but it, it is a wonderful book. Excellent. So here's one, what after, you know, Grant had turned on the president who, a man that uh, Douglas thought had done a lot for his race. And he, um, Sumner had actually sent, he often sent uh, Douglas his speeches. So he sent speeches all around. He loved to do that. And sometimes if his correspondence got so overwhelming, he would just write to his secretary, send speech. And then he'd just put those in the mail and send them around. So anyway, um, he says, and here again, he says, I have your letter of today. This is January 6th, 1871. Okay. In answer, I have to say, I have said many things in your honor, but I remember no word I ever uttered of this character that I would now recall, no line of love and confidence that I would now erase. What you have been to me and to my oppressed race during the long years of your public life, you are still recognized to be higher than the highest, better than the best of all our statesmen. I have no fear that you will ever be less than this in my own heart, nor in that of my people. Wow. Again, there's that, that eloquence. Kind of, I mean, on yeah. the page, on the letter that he just probably scribbled, didn't think right. about it. But, <laughs> but there's that eloquence. It just keeps yes, coming Yes, be beautiful, very poetic, very beautiful. Yeah. Amazing. Well, thank you for sharing those excerpts. I'm glad we took the time to do that. The words, you know, themselves. Um, and again, I guess we're, we're at the end of our segment. This is so interesting. But our, my last question I had for you is we know that Sumner preceded Douglas in death. And do we know how Douglas may have honored uh, Senator Sumner posthumously? Well, this is very touching. Uh, at the funeral, and this was when... Uh, Sumner uh, died rather suddenly. I mean, he had been, been ailing, but he just had a, an attack of angina and several, um, he was sick. So there were several hours between his attack and his death. And actually, Kimberly, in the papers at the Sumner School, I was looking through, there is a list of a sheaf of telegrams that were sent and they will say, Sumner still alive or mm. Sumner <laughs> failing. Wow. And they were just, the public was waiting to hear more, you know. Right. And it's like when a president or anything, you know, I guess JFK's assassination, there was a time when he was shot, and then there's a time when they say he's dead. So this was going on. So anyway, then they had a grand funeral, and uh, despite Sumner's <laughs> um, being a very... Um, a thorn in the side of the Republicans, he had a grand, a grand funeral and lay in the in state in the Capitol. And after the funeral, Douglas headed the Civil Rights League delegation. And the, this is one that took Sumner's coffin from the Capitol to the train station. And that's when the coffin was headed for Boston. And that's where Sumner is buried at Mount Auburn Cemetery in Cambridge. So he was there for the very end. To the very end. Well, yeah. this has been wonderful. Thank you so much, Beverly, for your knowledge and expertise on Senator Sumner. We look forward to the next um, topic. And to our viewers, if, again, if you have any questions for Beverly, please send us an email at info.sumnermuseum at dc.gov. And if you have an idea for some other things we should discuss as it pertains to the life of Senator Sumner, we are open. So thank you for sure. us. Thank you, Beverly. And thank you to our viewers. And we'll see you next time. It's always a pleasure. Wonderful. Mm -hmm.